Ilurophobia. So, I start, hesitantly. I'm not a Terran? Toon asks, matter-of-factly. Well, uncertainly, drumming my talons against my perch, I decide to err on the side of caution. Are you? She gives a mirthful puff of air through her nostrils before taking a moment to think. It's true, I'm not a human, nor have I ever set foot on Terra, nor for that matter have I ever been within 50 light years of the Sol system. Despite that, she breaks off here. I prompt, despite that? She seems to pluck confidence from the ether in a very Terran fashion. I would consider myself Terran by upbringing, ma'am. I completed a full certification at Neutron Zone University on Nova Feroscania, making me a fully qualified auxiliary security officer. I immediately have half a dozen questions, but managed to decide on one to start with. What is your species and homeworld, Miss Toon? With decidedly deaf world confidence, she answers, I am a Don of the planet Donulu. It's a tightly locked Class 9 rough world in proximity to the Crab Nebula. It also has a highly isolationist culture, hence your unfamiliarity with it and the Don. Rough world? Taylor answers, there are planets that straddle the line between Garden World and Death World. Threats are lie present, but nothing so egregious as to make the planetary certification nerds sh- mess themselves. Sapient Rough Worlders ain't as rare as Sapient Death Worlders, but still pretty rare. Maybe a dozen in known space. He glances at Toon. That about the size of it? She nods at him and smiles with just a hint of purple in her cheeks. Just so, Mr. Taylor. Her tone makes it clear that she's unused to others' familiarity with the classification. He mirrors her smile. Breaking these two from their staring contest, I ask, So, if it's not an overly personal question, how did you come to have a Terran upbringing? A pained expression flashes over her features for just a moment before she collects herself. Taking great care of her work, she starts, I was born around five years after the Galactic Union's great Cosimant Agreement, wherein the Terrans were given settlement and development rights for all the galaxy's death worlds, which had thus far been considered unsettable. A year after that, the Nova Fenoscadian colony was established on a death world a scan few light years from Don Ulu. She pauses here to collect herself. Breaking with the policy of isolationism, my birth parents' clan decided to make diplomatic outreach to our new neighbours. My birth parents were sent as ambassadors. My older siblings travelled with them. They became firm friends with their opposite numbers, Katrin Varadotir and Haidir Aranadotir, such that they were named godmothers when I was born. That's a Terran custom, where a parent selects a friend to raise their children in the event that they are killed. Of course, Terrans would have a tradition of nominating seconds to complete the task of parenting in the event of their mortality, as if joining to the death. She continues, When I was six years old, my birth parents made what was supposed to be a brief trip back to Donolu, and left me and my siblings in the care of Katrina and Heidi. They never came back, and Donolu rejected all future attempts at diplomatic outreach. I learned later that it's presumed there was a clan coup, and my birth parents were executed. Me and my siblings were left in the care of Katrina and Heidi, who became our foster parents. They loved us as if we were their own, and I grew up as one of the few non deaf elders on Nova Feroscandia. I give a soft, sympathetic keen and whimper slightly, as I say, Miss Toon, I apologise for making you recount that, it was insensitive of me. Thank you for trusting us with what must be a painful memory. She gives a reassuring smile. Composing myself, I ask my next question. Forgive me my ignorance, but what exactly is an auxiliary security officer? I've not come across this designation before. Ah, yes, that was actually the result of a compromise reached between the GU and the UTC. After the ceasefire of the United Terran Coalition's first contact war, Terran security officers immediately became the UTC's most in-demand export. GU is very strict that Terran refers to biological Homo sapiens and Homo resurrecti species, Neanderthalus, Desinova, Longi, and, and Tushwain, but doesn't include any other Terran upless species or deaf world race non Terrans. However, Terrans have an extremely fierce pack bonding instinct and objected, rather fervently, to being legally segregated from what they saw as kin. So, in compromise, the creation of the Auxiliary Security Officer qualification was authorised by the GU's Office of Deaf World Relations, allowing assorted culturally deaf world individuals like myself to have a route to security officerhood. My course was adapted to my differing physiology and psychology, in so far as those adaptations wouldn't compromise my competence for duty. ASO effectively means I qualify as a full Terran SO, but only in the company of other Terran SOs, so while I wouldn't legally be able to safeguard a Death Expedition alone, 
I could do so in the company of another SO. I think for a moment. So you're saying that if I send you a Mr. Taylor or any of the new hires on the Devoid Expedition, I could increase the headcount of researchers from 6 to 12? If I sent you in two Terran SOs, it could be 18, etc.? Exactly, she smiles. I look at her requested rate. It's only just over half that of Brunhilde Samus Aran, Francois Dog Normand, and Guillemin Conqueror Normad are asking an easier third of Taylor's salary. It would be a fantastic deal, but that thought makes me uncomfortable for some reason. I put that thought to the back of my mind and say, for further questioning I have to pass you over to our resident Terran, as my research lead appears to be somewhat indisposed. Shaanza looks up from the note she's been furiously tapping out, no doubt hypothesising wildly about all the novel information on human pack bonding that we've been inundated with. She gives a self-conscious curl of her trunk, but then returns it to a holopad. I gesture. Taylor? He leans forward. In what ways do your physiology and psychology differ from a standard Terran's to him? Aside from the obvious, of course. She starts counting on her upper right hand. On the negative side, I will never be able to have quite the strength, stamina, or durability that a Bioterran does. Growing up on a planet of 1.8 galactic stamina G has made me stronger than any Don Olu raised on. Bitterly, she adds, as well as stunting my growth to a mere 2.2 meters. But I am still relatively frail by your standards. I also have only what I would call a well-developed sense for danger, not quite the preternatural sense for it that Bioterrans have. I'm also quite sensitive to bright lights, being from the twilight zone of an eyeball world. She now shifts her account from her right hand to her left. On the positive side, I easily adjust to an upended sleep schedule. I can move faster than a Bioterran, as my inertia is lower for not being as dense. In a dead sprint, I can reach upwards of 60 km per hour in Earth's standard gravity, though I can only maintain that for around 30 seconds. I interrupt. Is that fast? Directing my question more at Taylor than Toon. He answers. Extremely. Clearly impressed. That's nearly 20% higher than the record for an unaugmented Terran. He gives an approving nod for her to continue. Beaming in the prey, she resumes. My graduate epitaph was very nearly eel instead of elf, as a result of my fighting style. My classmates called it slippery. This is as a result of the fact that, compared to a bioterran, I have superior reflexes and higher perceptual temporal resolution. Faster than I can resolve, something happens. Taylor and Toon have both moved, and Toon appears to be holding something she wasn't before. She cocks an eyebrow at him and says, Satisfied? He nods. Oh yeah. In Osprey Wilderman, I ask, What just happened, Taylor? What did you do? Toon answers. He threw a stress ball at me to test my claim about my reaction times. I appear to have passed. Mortified, I turn to Taylor. Taylor, how could you have been so reckless? What if it hit her? With a mollifying wave of the offending hand, he says, Relax, Cap. It was a foam ball. That throw could have hit you, and it wouldn't have done more than knock you off your perch. She noticed as I was throwing it, and snatched it out of the air, with no warning from a distance of four meters, which is practically point blank. She then intuitive reasoning behind that throw without missing a beat. Majorly impressive. I round on Taylor, wings and crown plumes raised. He shrinks and says, Sorry, Cap. Still in my stance of aggression, I say, It's not me you need to apologize to. A moment for it to click. Sorry, Toon. She weighs a hand. Uh, quite alright, Taylor. Quite alright, Captain. No harm meant, no harm done. I appreciate the opportunity to prove my capabilities. Satisfied, I motion to move on. Taylor asks, So what would be a comfortable frame rate for you? Between 200 and 350 frames a second. Lower than 200 and video starts to look choppy to me. Higher than 350 and extra frames makes no difference. Taylor whistles, clearly impressed. That's, what, five times a Bioterran? More? Old Terran movies must be hell for you. She nods. Yeah, like a slideshow. They're a little nauseating in an unaltered state, but I do have a program on my holopad to maximize frames. You just feed it the original footage and brings it up to a comfortable frame rate by computer modeling and generating what the tween of frames would have looked like. It is somewhat computationally demanding, though, so I can't run it without access to a more powerful computer. Well, Taylor says, smiling. The ship has computational power to spare. Maybe we can have a movie night sometime. I'm interested to see what It's a Wonderful Life looks like at 350 FPS. Later. After much death order flirting and admiration of CQC and firearm videos from Toon's university. Well, there's just one more thing before I tentatively accept you, Miss Toon. I gesture at the salary she's asked for and her face drops. It's too much. I told my brother, but he was all like, you need to value yourself, Toon. They'll never take you seriously if you don't take yourself seriously, and I went, yes, but what if they find it off-putting and I don't get the job? I hold up a claw to science, the unintelligible gibbering. 
and she falls mercifully silent. Too much, dear girl. The Castonian staff make more than this, and all they do is sit on their behinds, especially cleaning droids all day. Your brother was right, or maybe he wasn't. I couldn't really follow at the speed you were talking. The point is, it would shame me as your captain if word got around that I paid so little for your services. So, could you accept 90% again? Her jaw drops. That would be almost what you pay a standard SO. I couldn't. I snap back. You can and you will if you want the job. Speechless a few moments, she eventually answers, What would you say to 50% again? Cocking a brow tough, I respond. You're haggling me down? That's extremely unusual. Fixing her gaze on her feet, she mumbles, I'm not worth... Too much. With a terrible sigh, I relent. 80% final offer. That's 10% less than standard for the inconvenience of not being able to send you out alone. This is in spite of the fact that, now that I have more than one SO, it really makes no difference if you're an SO or an ASO. What do you say? I extend my wing claws. Tentatively, she encloses them in her hand and says, Okay, deal. Excellent, I crow. Now, if you would tell my mate... Secretary, that you being successful, will be along to guide you in the hours to the final suitability test, shortly. Shanza, you're also free to go. Y yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Toon says giddily, practically sprinting from the room, shortly followed by my clearly relieved research lead. I turn to Taylor, who's still gazing at the doorway, eyes fixed on the last point that he had line of sight to Toon. I chitter. Well, you certainly have a type. Snapping back to reality, he takes a few moments to compose himself. I've no idea what you might be referring to, Cap, he says carefully. Raising a leg, I start counting my talons. Big eyes, big, midnight blue body, six limbs, death order, after a fashion, twilight zoner. I'm seeing some similarities to a certain other object of your affections. Scratching his face in distaste, Taylor answers. To start, Fluffy's Prussian blue with charcoal black stripes. How a species of trichromates have so many subtle colour distinctions, I'll never know. Who needs more than one word for black? Next, he continues. To humans, the suggestion that a person might be your desire to be romantically or sexually involved with a pet is extremely distasteful, even indirectly, even in jest. I interrupt. So you're admitting that you would like to have sexual and or romantic involvement with Miss Toon. After all, you did throw that ball at her like a fleshing pluckling the plume feathers of her favourite boy at school. I point out smugly. Finally, he says with gritted teeth. It'd be unprofessional of me to fraternize with a subordinate. I'm stunned. Do you think I'm unprofessional, Taylor? It takes a moment before it clicks and he realizes what he just implied. Stammering, he replies, N -n No, Cap, it ain't like that. Your situation with Cork, that's like normal for a quality, right? I got no standing to judge. I flap, sharply, once, and he shuts up. I understand you didn't make the connection, Taylor. It's okay. Just maybe keep an open mind. She's clearly interested in you as well. And the whole point of this exercise is to find you companionship, while filling out the positions we would have needed filled anyway. He pouts, clearly not convinced. Just some food for thought. I don't expect you to be an ascetic, Taylor. It's ironic that you death voters all too often forget that you're mortal too. He nods ponderously. If nothing else, it'd be nice to get to know the ship's second honorary death worlder, he muses. I cock my head, confused. Second? Who's the first? He shoots me a wiry smile. You're kidding, right? You, you big doof. I splutter. How? In what way? Requali are frugivorous garden worlders. You could pick me up and dash me against this desk before I knew what was happening. On what basis? Smirking, he says. You're shrewd like a death worlder. You're fierce like a death worlder. You're suspicious like a death worlder. You might have the body of a garden worlder, but your spirit is the spirit of a death worlder. Darmstruck, I eventually respond. Taylor, in all my cycles, I have never been accorded such a dubious honour. He laughs heartily at that. Taking a moment to recompose myself, I say, Now, how about we go administer our final test? Hmm, you're insisted upon surprise for them? He smiles mischievously. Later. For the second time in the last sub-cycle, I sit by the hospital bed of an unconscious Terran. This time, thankfully, he isn't injured. Huh, what? He starts awake. Mr. Norman, good to have you back, I greet. What happened? Where am I? What What was that thing? You fainted. The medical room of the Bright Plume and Fluffy, I respond coolly. Fluffy, he says incredulous. Fluffy, the Etescian Merc Beast of Deck 5, terror of all non-Terrans, initiator of shipwide lockdowns, and the reason that CSS Victor cuddles Taylor, 
It's currently on disciplinary probation, I quip. It glances over the other beds. Where's everyone else? They're settling into their new accommodations and probably giving Fluffy more pets and scritches than even she can handle in the Starboard Deck 5 common room. He gawks, disbelieving. They stayed with that thing? They didn't faint? They weren't scared? In answer, I bring out my holopad and, bored, begin reading aloud from the transcript from the SD5 hall cam footage, starting the moment he lost consciousness. McLeod. Oh my god, Mogafloof! Aran. So fierce. All the scritches for you. Taylor. She's wonderful, isn't she? Duan. She looks like the Cheshire Cat going through a goth phase. I love it. McLeod. Or like the Capos from Torto. God, she's so sleek. Zombrari. I could cull her all day, every day. Aran. Right, proper danger noodle. Duan. Nuh uh. Danger noodles are snakes. Look at those little legs. Jenny had it right. McLeod. Yeah, Madafloof. Toon. It's as if someone put the eyes of an owl onto the face of a baby kitten puppy hybrid, then stuck that onto a fair raccoon hybrid body, and tie dyed the whole thing with the advice of an emo tiger, and then hit it with a grove ray and a cute ray for way longer than advisable. F. Norman. Guys, my brother is, um, kind of aerophobic. He had a bad experience when we were kids. He might not be con- Fuck. Grimming! Grimming! That was how long it took anyone to notice you lost consciousness. If it's any consolation, I think you're the sane one. However, unfortunately, through no fault of your own, you have demonstrated a lack of suitability for the Terran Enclave aboard my vessel. I've explained the situation to your brother and agreed a very generous reimbursement for your lost time and stress, a token of goodwill. He's already explained that the two of you are a package deal, as he puts it, so don't worry about us whisking him away. He says to me, dumbstruck. Perhaps you should check your account balance? Still mute, he turns his head away, pulls up his holopat, and taps for a few moments before gasping. You weren't kidding about it being generous. What on earth for? He blurts. Death World is with a grudge or a nightmare scenario for any sane captain, or sane person for that matter. As I said, it's a token of goodwill. You do not have to worry, ma'am. I'm going to do my best to never think of this ship or that monster again. I nod and begin walking away. Before I leave, I say, It's a shame it didn't work out, Mr. Normand. Good luck in your future travels, perhaps. Try to avoid a Teskia free.